Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for waiting patiently while we had a late start. You know, I have some of these situations where everything goes wrong. First of all, I left half of my speech at home. I probably know it anyway, but you know. And then I uh, lost my uh, thumb drive with my uh, PowerPoint presentation. So this has been an interesting last 10 minutes. I trust the rest of the lecture will be a lot quieter. I want to welcome you today to the first of the many law lectures this year, sponsored by the Schulich School of Law. The best of the many laws, they tell me. I guess you'll decide that later. A uh, series of the best of the many, many law lectures later, or, 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 or over this term, which is are going to be in commemoration of Dalhousie University's 200th anniversary. I should introduce myself. I'm Faye Woodman. And I have taught for, it's unbelievable, 38 years at Dalhousie Law School, the University of Ottawa, and Sherbrooke University in the areas of estate planning, trusts, property, and elder law. I have also, on occasion, from time to time, with others, advised the Nova Scotia Law Reform Commission on special topics such as matrimonial law, intestate succession, um, powers of appointment, and other such legal instruments. And I'll refer to proposals by the Law Reform Commission of of Nova Scotia, which I think has been renamed to the Institute for Law Reform and Access to Law. That might not be exactly correct. I'm going to refer to these proposals by the Nova Scotia Law Reform Commission, but I think I'll keep my feet firmly in the law as it is. Because if I keep telling you, well, it could be this and could be that, that's very confusing and doesn't tell those of you who are thinking of drawing up a will now exactly what law you'll be facing. I will talk about the will today, but I'm also going to be talking about some other adjacent talk, uh, documents. Powers of attorney, continuing powers of attorney, and uh, personal care directives. And I think they're important documents, separate from your will, but traditionally uh, drafted at the time your will is drafted. So the first question that I'm going to answer, this works, is why have a will? Why do we have a will? Because a lot of you are thinking, hey, I, don't get, I haven't got much money. I have everything in joint tenancy. You know, why should I have a will? Well, lawyers will tell us that we have to review a will every five years, but we don't. I don't. Sometimes I'm surprised to see what I put in previous wills. Uh, so we write a will and it might last for a very long time. So our circumstances may change over the years that we have a will. And it's important to have that will that will uh, represent or represent your interest in most circumstances. If you don't draft a will, you'll have something like a government-drawn will. If you don't have a will, the government will draw a will for you. And the terms of the will are delineated by the testators, um, the Intestate Succession Act. The Intestate Succession Act tells us what kind of will we're going to have if the government draws, us for, draws it for us. And frankly, I think for most of us here, and of varying ages and backgrounds, just looking around, I think a government-drawn will won't do what we want. For one thing, in government-drawn wills, there is a possibility, sometimes a certainty, that children will take under the will. That's really not OK for most Canadian couples, where the wills that they draft privately <coughs> excuse me, are essentially all to the spouse, and then when both spouses have died, 
than to the children. That's not what a government will does. It says to the spouse under certain circumstances and certain maximums and then to the children or not then to the children and to the children as well. I don't know about you, but I have passed the time of sleepless nights. I have managed to survive the terrible twos. I enjoyed that short period before my children reached the age of adolescence. But emotionally and psychologically, if my partner dies, please, please leave all the property to me, at least for a while, until I get older. Not only emotionally and psychologically do I want the children to take, but uh, many people cannot really have a, a viable economic life unless they inherit all the estates of the deceased spouse. So that's very important for you to consider if you think, well, I'll let the government draw up my will. The other thing that the government does, which is really quite exceptional, and most people don't understand it, is at least in Nova Scotia, we discriminate against common law spouses. So under a government-drawn will, you, the common law, your common law spouses will not take anything. And during the years that I was teaching property law, uh, every year at the first of the year, I'd ask my law students, lawyers-to-be, what they thought the position in Nova Scotia was of a common law spouse. And most of them seemed to think that after some lapse of years, a common law spouse is treated like a legally married spouse. Not so. If you leave, if you don't draw up a will, you have a common law spouse, that common law spouse will be left with nothing. Now, I specialize in getting around that circumstance. And I know ways that perhaps might succeed, but they're not ways that the general audience would like to take. Litigation, and the guess is you start this litigation at about $80,000 of legal fees. So prevent that in the first place by giving or making sure that you have a will and that in that will you bequeath to your common law spouse, assuming you want to. I know one story that happened in Nova Scotia, which is, it, it, it I think exemplifies how families fall apart or lose their senses or become insane when money is involved. And in this case, a young couple lived together for 10 years, not legally married. He was a motorcycle enthusiast. And one day, regrettably, he was in a crash and he died. At that point, his parents sued the estate for the young man's estate, which would have precluded a taking by the wife or the partner and the children, their two children. The Nova Scotia government said rightly that there are no illegitimate children. They're just children. And the children did take from the father's estate. However, it's noteworthy that in that particular case, the common law spouse didn't claim anything from the estate. And if she had, she wouldn't have won. So you had a very odd situation because someone didn't uh, drop a will of the kids having all the fun family money and their care giver and their mother being absolutely without anything. So you obviously don't want that. Draw up a will. Subsequently, this position was uh, solidified by the Supreme Court of Canada, who said that if you're living common law, that must mean that you're thinking that you're going to keep your property separate. Well, I think most of us know that common law spouses often don't think exactly what's going to be the upshot of death or separation. They don't think of things at that time. And so the common law spouses um, go on and function as if it's a marriage. And the dissenting judge in that case said, if something looks like a marriage, functions as a marriage, it should be treated in law as a marriage. But in Nova Scotia, it isn't. 
Now, I should tell you again that the Law Reform Commission of Nova Scotia is developing a discussion paper which would change the nature of govern government-drawn wills and would allow, for example, common law spouses to inherit. But it has other aspects to it which may or may not be adopted by the government, which would be, I think, even more unsalutary. Uh, for example, uh, the inclusion of stepchildren as people who might inherit under a government will. And I think the upshot of all of this is that if you want a will that serves you and your circumstances, then you must have your own will drawn up. And you cannot rely on a government drawn will, or what they call in the legislation, to be in testacy. <coughs> There are other reasons to have a, a will, and you might think that you're home free if you don't have kids and um, you're legally married, say you're two young professors and uh, everything's great and you don't want to get involved in drawing up wills, you're too busy having fun and you can see this couple here is having a lot of fun except that I didn't show the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> now, whether they did or did not such, uh, suffer an unfortunate fate, I don't know, but we'll assume they did. And there's a rule in Nova Scotia that says where people die in a common accident and you can't know who dies first, then it will be assumed that the elder dies first and then the uh, younger dies next. Well, what importance has this, you'd say? Well, if you don't have a will that deals with common disasters, then under a government-drawn will, then what will happen is the property of usually the man, because the man is usually a year or two older, will devolve to his wife, who is dead, but she's the second to die, according to this deeming provision, and then all that property will devolve to her parents and his parents won't get anything. And that's a perverse result which we can eliminate by drawing up our wills, but happens under a government-drawn will. There's lots of other things that if you don't have a will, you can't do. And one of them, and it's very important, is to be able to give specific gifts to specific loved ones as beneficiaries. So whether it's my old battered guitar, or my, uh, my, my skis, or my diamond ring with emeralds uh, circling the center of it, whatever it is. If I want to give a specific gift to a specific individual, I must have my own will. I had a client once many years ago, and she was a lady of frugal disposition. And she didn't want me to drop a will for her because she, it was her intention in her old antique-filled home to devise specific furniture and specific china to particular nieces and nephews and members of her family. So she thought that putting it all down the will and paying me to do that was an awful waste of money. So what she did is she went to each couch, each chair, each table, even the china, and she labeled them with the names of the potential beneficiary. Now, in law, as far as I could see, this had no effect at all. Although it was interesting to have tea with her, because you just tip up the teacup and you can find out who the beneficiary was. <laughs> Happily, her family agreed with this, and so there was no dispute, and things went on as she, she wanted. But if they had have disputed, I don't think she would have had her way. The other thing that you might think of in a will is to leave specific gifts to a charity. And um, whether we're not, obviously, Bill and Melinda Gates, 
and we're not yeah. Warren Buffin, Buffett, but we probably have some small amount of assets that we want to give to a charity. And you can't do that under a government-drawn will, but you can under an ordinary will. And I should say that when you are giving assets to charities, please, please indicate who in the charity is to have control and at what level the charity. Don't give a gift to the Catholic Church. Designate the priest in the parish. Don't give uh, a, a gift to soccer. Say it's soccer Nova Scotia or Canadian national soccer, whatever. So you have to be very careful when you give uh, charitable gifts. I think at this point, you'll say that notwithstanding everything that Professor Woodman says, I really still don't think I should have a will. Uh, wills are expensive. They're lost leaders for lawyers, but I still don't want to spend that money. And uh, most of my property is in joint tenancy, and virtually every one of us here would have property in joint tenancy, particularly our house. Joint tenancy means that when one other person dies, the other person takes over. So my husband and I have a house in joint tenancy. I die, he gets the rest of the house, the whole house. Or vice versa, he dies, and I get the house. And wills don't affect that. It's nothing to do with wills. But there's another area that are without wills, or not affected by wills specifically, that are very important, which is when you get your will drawn up, one of the things the lawyer or you should do is take a careful review of the property to which beneficiaries are designated. In this respect, I want to talk about special kinds of property. And the special kinds of property are registered retirement savings plans, tax-free savings plans, pension plans, uh, insurance, insurance uh, policies. And usually in these contracts, you designate the beneficiary in these contracts right in the contracts. You don't do it in your will. You can do it in your will. It's somewhat complicated. But usually you designate beneficiaries uh, in the contracts. The problem with designated beneficiaries is that they're not revoked by your marriage or divorce. And this happened uh, with an assistant of mine whose ex-husband, 20 years after they parted and 20 years after the last spoke, died and forget, or forgot to change the designation on his RRSP. So to everybody's surprise, all the amount in the RRSP RRSP went to his former wife. Uh, whether you think this is justice or not, she did because <laughs> she thought it was just virtually ad adequate compensation. Um, the other things that there are other things that you should do when you drop a will. For one thing, even if you think you don't need a will that badly. You're, some of you anyway are the baby boom generation as I am and we expect to inherit a lot of money so to make our property a little different than a, a bunch of things held in joint tenancy. That's one thing. The second thing is that drawing up a will gives us the opportunity to think about ways of saving tax. Even if we have a little money ways of saving tax can have a significant difference on our uh, financial position. And in this respect, I want to talk about one particular problematic area. It is parents who have children with disabilities. Uh, these parents of their middle class are caught in sort of a, a middle world, being middle class. They're not poor enough to say, well, whatever that child is going to get is only going to get from social welfare, but not rich enough to say that we won't worry about social assistance or social welfare. So the aim of this middle class uh, couple with a disabled child is one, to give them extras in life, to give them the special things the special trips, the special education, the special uh, perhaps equipment they need. At the 
at the same time, not disentitling the particular adult child to his or her social welfare benefits. So it's tricky. It's nice to give things in your will to your child, but the only effect of that is it substitutes the government money with yours. That's not a very good result because certainly the child isn't better off. There are ways of doing this in a limited way. You should look at registered disability savings plan and qualified uh, tax-free trusts. And both these kinds of trusts and Henson trusts are ways of preserving to some extent rights to social service by giving a child who's disabled and unable to earn their own money a little extra. So that's something you would want to do when you're drawing up your will. And really, you would need a, disabled, you would need a lawyer to help you draw a will up for a disabled child. Now, there's a couple other things that you can do that are important too. And um, this person is important. Um, this is Fido here. I was going to get a picture of my cat. Uh, he comes, she comes by her name, Via Lou Harris. Her name's Sweet Jane. And um, Sweet Jane just wouldn't cooperate today. She didn't feel like it. So there's Fido. The thing is, your animals, although Professor Black may disagree with the philosophy, is our property. And so in a government will, your animals would go with other property. The problem is there would be no provision for their future feeding toys or catnip or anything good like that. I figure today we have uh, many people going and buying uh, marijuana, so at least my cat should have her catnip. <laughs> well, there's no way once I die, once her caregivers die, that she's necessarily going to be provided with these things. So what I will do as a lawyer is I'll set up a little trust, which is just a mechanism to allow one person to hold and administer property on behalf of another person. And usually in a trust, the beneficiary of the trust is a person. But occasionally the common law lets the beneficiary of the trust be an animal. And these animals could be your cats or your dogs or your horses or whatever. Um, the late, hardly lamented, Leona Helmsley, the queen of hotels, actually left a couple million dollars to her little dog. And it's interesting because the uh, care, caregivers of that dog were quite happy to accept the challenge of looking after the dog, who after all only had a few million, but they were quite concerned over the monies they paid for security because the re big risk, as they saw, was the dog was going to be dog napped. And they didn't want that to happen, so uh, it didn't work out necessarily as well, perhaps, as she thought. Anyway, my cat or your dog is uh, obviously, you're not going to have a trust so large as that, and we could make provision for the welfare after we die. Um, I told you a few things about what. Uh, will can do, but what does, what can't a will do? We like to talk about this thing, you've probably heard about this idea of testamentary freedom. A man, because it was in the days of men, a man can do whatever he wants with his property and leave his children penniless and his wife hungry. And that was the idea initially of the common law. Today, things have changed somewhat. And anyone who's making a will is limited by three or four principles. The first thing that limits you in making your will is a right in Nova Scotia for the surviving spouse to have a one half share of the estate of the deceased. So that eliminates a lot of risk for the surviving spouse because he or she, as the case may be, may be able to 
uh, take one half of the estate. Now, the estate is defined for the purposes of this act as matrimonial assets, and that doesn't include all assets in Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia is really uh, unique insofar as it defines matrimony assets, but as not to include business assets. But again, the Law Reform Commission of, uh, of Nova Scotia has made a, a, a paper that the government, I understand, has rather uh, positively received, and this may be changed in the future, but in some ways not for the better, if you want to have testamentary freedom, to include not only matrimonial assets, but all assets. But this is a change that hasn't been officially adopted by the government, nor has any legislation been introduced. So your testamentary freedom is limited right there by the fact that half of the deceased property goes to the surviving spouse. The second way that your testamentary freedom uh, is limited is by the fact of the testator's family maintenance application. The testator's family maintenance act application is the means why or how in the vernacular you can test a will. You can test a will under this legislation. Um, in Nova Scotia, uh, a number of people in various provinces across Canada can contest the will. And some provinces allow a larger group than other provinces. But in Nova Scotia, the only two people who can contest a will are the wife. And let's face it, she's really pretty well off with her half share under the Matrimonial Property Act, or the children. Now, by children, and this is very significant, not only can minor children contest the will, which one would think would be an obvious, but adult children who are not reliant on a parent can also contest a will. There's only really um, with respect to uh, testamentary freedom, it's in Nova Scotia, the Nova Scotia courts have, uh, have shown a considerable dislike in really actively supporting adult children in contesting the parents' wills. Some courts, such as those in BC, have been much more active, but the courts in Nova Scotia are quite conservative. The um, formulation is, they ask, did the testator, that's the person who died, did the testator make adequate provision for the proper maintenance and support of the spouse and the child? Was adequate provision made for the support of a child? Well, if you ask me, if the child is an adult, zero is adequate provision for an adult child, really. So is there any circumstance, mom's pretty well governed by the Matrimonial Property Act. But what about the kids? Minor kids are going to get a share, obviously. But what about adult kids? Kids that you don't like, kids that you don't get along. <laughs> I was saying to my brother-in-law, your kids really answer you much faster than my do. My, my do. And he said, no, I was, I was under misapprehension. His takes three to four days. And I said, that's better. Mine only uh, texts me when he needs something. But that's, that's kids of a certain age. But uh, you, ha you might have to support these kids. Um, and what do, you, what, what do we consider adequate provision for the proper maintenance support if there are adults on their own who've left the house? There is provision in the Wills Act for you to write in the wills while you're not giving money to certain people, especially if you think the will might be contested. That won't eliminate any litigation necessarily, but it'll give the court an insight into why you're doing what you're doing. Generally speaking, there's, in interpreting these words, there's a two-step test. First of all, if you're legally required during your lifetime to support somebody, then after your death, you're going to have to continue to support them, like minor children and a spouse, which I said is 
more or less uh, being taken care of by the matrimonial property uh, laws in any case. So an adult child wouldn't fall within that first rule. The second rule, however, is more discretionary in the courts, more sort of fuzzy. And the second rule is, does the testator, the person who's making the will, have a moral obligation to the adult child? And, and, and to determine if you have a moral obligation, you look at society's reasonable expectations in light of contemporary community standards. Now, isn't that just a way to give the court direction or discretion to do pretty well what they want to do? So in Nova Scotia, they don't like to do it very much, and they don't. In BC, they're much more freewheeling, and they are more apt to find uh, an adult child as an appropriate dependent under the Testator's Family Maintenance Act. There is one case there, it was before matrimonial uh, uh, property laws in BC, where a testator had a wife and two sons. He disinherited his wife, and the court soon put paid to that. He couldn't disinherit his wife. He had an obligation to support her. Spouses in marriage have an obligation to support each other, even though they may each individually have a job. But the question was, what about the two adult sons? He left all his estate to one favored son and left out his wife and the other disfavored son. Now, looking at the relationships over the years, we have to come to the conclude to conclude from the terms of the case that basically he didn't like the one of the sons because, well, he just didn't like him. And the court in that circumstance, while restoring most of the estate to the wife, also gave a little bit, not very big, but a little bit to show its displeasure to the disfavored son uh, and showing that uh, by disfavoring one son and, and advantaging another son for no particularly valid contemporary um, morals reason, then he shouldn't do that. And so uh, one of the sons, the disfavored son, didn't take as much as a favorite son, but he did take something. So too in Nova Scotia, sometimes the courts have been a little more lenient with kids, adult kids who've fallen on hard times, generally not for any reason that's all that unique to them. And in one case where her daughter was on social welfare, she did receive more monies than her siblings. The court does consider the whole relationship between the child and the testator. And uh, I, I will just briefly refer to some of the things it considers. It considers the character of the child the contact of the child and its relations with the parent, the financial circumstances of the child, uh, the, cl uh, the claims which any other children or spouse in some circumstances have upon the estate, any provision which the testator while living has made for the dependent or for any other dependent. So you often see the case of, um, I know of one case where there's two boys and one girl and another girl who is a woman with disabilities, and one of the girls has stayed home and all her life has looked after the woman with disabilities, and the two sons have gone on to have a full life of marriage and children and whatever. And come the time to divide up the seats, um, it may be that the woman who spent her life looking after a disabled younger sister may in fact have more of a claim than other people. And also, you look at services rendered by the dependent to the testator, uh, or any property given by the testator to the dependent. And this is often a source of conflict when a parent sets up one of the children, adult children, in a business, or lends them some money that never gets paid. Then equality among the children is often a subject of debate. So you can't. Uh, you are limited by the Matrimonial Property Act. You are limited by, uh, by the fact that you can challenge the, the will. And you are limited by certain 
public policy principles. And these public policy principles are not found in any legislation. They're not found somewhere written down. But they are derived from the cases settled by the courts of Nova Scotia and other courts over hundreds of years about what is or when something is against public policy. And public policy evolves like contemporary society evolves. So what was public policy a while ago may not be public policy today. But there are few things that I can say about public policy and wills. You can't in your will give an estate to somebody on condition that they never marry. That's prohibited. <laughs> or you can't give um, a state uh, property to uh, beneficiary on the condition that they divorce the present spouse. You can't give money in a state to a child that would interfere with the relationship between the child and their parent. So there's pretty obvious, these are pretty obvious ones. But you can give, it seems, from the cases, and I am, these are old cases, maybe decided a hundred years ago. So they seem old fashioned to us. It may not seem all, as old fashioned, some of newcomers to Canada. Um, for example, you, have to, you can say that somebody has to practice a religion. You can say that someone has to marry within the religion. Um, so the, this may um, uh, provide some uh, limitation on what you can do. Uh, with the advent of the Charter, which only governs relationships between the government and citizens and not between citizens, the Charter doesn't apply to wills, but the spirit of the Charter does apply to wills. So some of the more egregious and obnoxious uh, uh, conditions put on gifts under will may be eliminated as against public policy in the future. We see, just looking at a number of recent cases in Ontario and New Brunswick and other parts of the Maritimes, the court held it was against public policy to make a gift to a white supremacist organization, against public policy. Another one which is really interesting it was against public policy to allow the disinheritance of a girl who was um, a daughter of a black father, and she went out and had a child with a Caucasian father, and he disinherited her, and they, had, they said, well, there's a lot of reasons uh, in that case, but one of the things they didn't like, the court didn't like, was a public, it was against public policy to disinherit people solely on the basis of who they consorted with, uh, where it was a racial uh, distinction. And there is possibilities that have arisen in some jurisdictions where you disinherit a son because you don't like, or a daughter because you don't like their sexual preferences, then that too would be a condition and a will against public policy. So you can't obviously do anything you want in a will. You can do some things, but some things are against public policy. I want to talk about one other thing, and I promised to talk about it, and I reviewed my notes and my work in the area, and I have very little to say to you in more ways than one about digital assets. Well, what are digital assets? There are email, there are Facebook, there are LinkedIn, there are rewards or air miles. They are music, they are photographs in uh, Dropbox. Uh, they are dating sites. They are our little stash of whatever. Okay. Digital, the position of digital assets and what they are and what they mean is a little bit up in question in Canada today. The Uniform Conference of Canada has produced a model act on access to digital assets by fiduciaries. That's a mouthful. But that model act hasn't been adopted 
by any province in Canada. Now, 43 of the United States uh, states have adopted similar legislation, and that's significant because many digital states may be situated not in Canada, they might be situated in the United States and subject unreasonably, I think, and confusingly to American law. To sort out the exact position of digital uh, assets and what you can do with them, well, it's taken me one, one, um, one article of 50 pages or so, and I'm on my second one. So I don't think I'll do it today in the lecture. I'll tell you some practical things you can do, though. Uh, if you're worried about what's going to happen to your digital assets on your death, the first thing you should do is read the contents of the contract that you make between the provider, the person, Facebook, and yourself. And that contract is all that stuff that you skip <laughs> every time you get down to clicking, I agree. <laughs> and you have agreed to the most amazing things at times. You will not ever know that, really. But to know where you are in the first place, should you ever come to that situation, you might read the terms of the contract. They call it the terms of service, and I might fall into that uh, nomenclature. So you look at the terms of service, and sometimes the terms of service will tell you what happens on death. Like Facebook, you know it has a memorialization feature to it. You can appoint someone to take over your Facebook for a period of time after your death. But other digital assets and contracts between individuals and providers say nothing about death. Or they say very little and not enough to really guide you. So the courts are flexing themselves. They're trying to decide what to do with digital assets. And I think in Canada, the reason they're not going forward this model act is because it's so darn confusing because Digital assets, more than anything, are a matter of international law. Where is your Facebook situated? Is it situated where you write on your computer? Or is it situated in California? That's an interesting question. A lot of digital assets go across international lines. And then to figure out the law that applies will be the law of the appropriate international jurisdiction, which can be a very difficult thing to find out. The Europe has introduced, uh, the EU has introduced rules about digital assets just recently, last year. And they will help provide for us a model of what we should do. And frankly, we will also be influenced by the American example. We have to be, we will be because we're so close to America and we use so many of their digital assets. In the meantime, what to do? In the meantime, if you're worried about your digital assets after your death, then give somebody, your executor or friend or family, the um, passwords to your digital asset. I can see you doing that. You'll do it like I do. I can't remember the passwords of whatever I have now and giving them to someone to look after. I mean, it seems too much to do, to tell you the truth. But that's the theory. If you're approaching that time in life when you are looking at the loss of all your digital assets, give your password to somebody else. Now, that is complicated because some of the terms of services of those digital assets say that if you give your password to anyone else, the contract is immediately canceled and you lose everything. So if you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. The other thing is you could put your passwords in what they call digital vaults. You see them advertised, where they'll hold your password until you die and then give the passwords to the executors. My big question of everybody is, do you really want some or all of your digital assets to be examined by your friends, family, or executor? And the answer may be no. I don't want my Madison Ashley dating site to be examined by my executor family. I don't want my stash of whatever, porn or whatever. I don't want them. So there's a whole problem of some people want to let their family know what's in their digital assets. And some people would just as well that the provider throw the key away 
And so it's difficult, one, to get access when you want access, and it's difficult to close down the digital asset when you want it closed down. So no matter what you do, it's fraught with difficulty. So the best thing is to read the terms of service. If you agree with the terms of service, go with that. If you don't, uh, I guess, risk giving your, your password to a friend or the executor. Um, and if you don't want anyone to um, investigate your digital assets, maybe it's best not to speak about them at all. <laughs> Well, the question I want to ask now is, who can make a will? And that's really a simple question in the first situation. Oh, that's challenge wills. Who can make a will? Well, you can make a will if you're of age, over the age of majority, and uh, under the age of majority if you're married, interestingly enough. There's special rules for soldiers and mariners. The problem that will arise in most of your lives will be that in order to make a will, you have to have something called mental competence. And mental competence is sometimes a tricky problem when you're dealing with seniors. They may or may not have a mental competence. It's interesting that for every legal function in the common law, there's a test for mental competence. What I'm saying, in other words, is that you could have mental competence to do one legal thing and mental, not mental competence to another legal thing. So interestingly enough, the courts have said, and this is very controversial, but this seems to be the law in Canada, that you need more mental competence to drop a will than to marry. That's an extraordinary thing, isn't it? Um, in fact, the highest level of legal or mental competence seems to be to make a will. And you have to know a couple of things when you make a will. So if you're, you're, you have a senior and you're a caregiver and the senior wants to make a will, you have to make sure they have mental competence. And it's a delicate task. If you're doubtful, the lawyer, hospital, or uh, medical professionals will help you with that with different kinds of tests. But it's a very sensitive thing to do to find out if uh, elders or seniors have mental competence. And you should realize that you only have to have mental competence when you're executing your will and giving directions for your will. So that you could maybe, with one senior, make a will in the morning and it would be perfectly okay because in the morning they're fresh and bright, bright and they have mental competence. And then in the afternoon or the evening, they get tired and they lose that mental confidence. And that's okay if you've got a validly drawn will and executed will in the morning. So too, uh, one day they might have mental confidence and then the next day they mightn't have mental confidence. That's all right, as long as they make their will during that period of lucidity. To, know, to make a will, this is what a senior has to know. They have to know in a very general way what making a will is. They don't have to understand what a will is. They just have to understand that they're doing something that will promote the accession of their property on their death to some other person. They have to know what a, making a will means. They have to, have to know in very general terms the nature and extent of their property. And they also have to know who are the natural objects of their bounty. Who would one expect that they should leave property to? Who are their friends? Who are their families? And finally, they should be not laboring under any delusion that distorts the process of will-making. And the delusion that often will distort that process of will-making among seniors is they think their children are stealing the property. That seems to come up a lot. And that's a distortion that will be make, the, make them unable to participate in the will-making uh, process because that view distorts the whole idea of the natural objects of the boundaries. Uh, in one case, uh, the caregiver, a sister, was obviously the person that probably should have received the property. But her sister, who was in the advanced stages of dementia, developed a... Uh, 
uh, passionate love for the local hermit and made a will and left everything to him. And the court held in that case, she didn't have will making power. There are two ways of making a will. There's a formal will that lawyers generally make. It's, in ty it's typed usually. It's signed at the bottom by the testator and witnessed by two witnesses in a certain formality. A certain, there's a certain way of doing that. And if it isn't done, you're, 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 the witnesses must sign in uh, the presence of each other in the presence of the testator. So that's what kind of formal will. Well, so many people got the formalities of a formal will mucked up, including lawyers. Either they didn't have the proper signatures, or the people didn't uh, sign in, in the proper order. So what happened is that the government brought in another type of will, which had been around in other jurisdictions for some time. In Nova Scotia, we have holograph wills. Now, the holograph will is a will which is entirely, I mentioned that, entirely in your own handwriting and signed by you at the bottom. So you think that one way or another, testators in Nova Scotia would be able to make a formal will or a holograph will. But the reality was uh, internet had intervened and you could see how filling in the blanks in an internet will without the formalities would not be exclusively in the handwriting of the testator, nor would how the formalities of a formal will would be n neither one nor the other. So uh, quite a few years ago, the government of Nova Scotia acted Section 8 of the Wills Act, which says that um, if a writing embodies the testamentary intention of the deceased and it can be proved, it will be treated as if it was a will. And this has been tested in a number of cases in Nova Scotia. And interestingly, I find it quite interesting, not always successfully on the part of the person who's alleging that this piece of paper is also part of the will or the will, even though not subject to the formalities of the will, nor a holograph will. But it's interesting that in New South Wales, fairly recently, a testator typed his will into his cell phone. Now, the question is, is that writing? I don't know. Didn't sign their name, and then committed suicide. And the person uh, was found later, the court found later, that was a valid written will. And even though it didn't fulfill either the formalities of the a formal will or a holograph will, it was a writing that encompass the testamentary intentions of the person who committed suicide. I want to talk about a few other things that you'll be interested in, I think, which is under a will, you have to have an executor. That's someone to carry out the obligations of the will. Now, an executor is someone appointed by you under the will, the will usually says, this is, the, this is my will and final testament of me, Faye Woodman. I hereby revoke my pre previous wills. And then the third line is, I point as my executor, A, B, or C, or all of the above. Now, the duties of the executor are really simple and can be subsumed in three rules. The executor has to get the property of the deceased in, has to gather all the property. And that can be a little more tricky than you'd realize. If you're an executor and you have a large extended family or even a small extended family, well, I got to be truthful with you. I never did get that Tiffany lamp that I wanted from my grandmother's. So what to do? The executor in these families where people run in and out and Take, uh, uh, organize themselves very informally, the first thing the executive should do is lock, lock the doors and notify the bank. You bring in the property and you try to, well, grandma promised me this when she died. She's died, therefore I'll take it now. No, not allowed. So the executor is responsible for gathering in the property. 
then the executor is responsible for paying all the debtors of the deceased. And finally, the executor is responsible for transferring what's left after payment of taxes and after uh, payment of funeral expenses and whatever to whoever it is owed, like the beneficiaries. And the beneficiaries might be directly to a beneficiary or a beneficiary who's a beneficiary under a trust set up for them. Probate is not always required of a will. Probate is where the court recognizes legitimacy of the executor, that the uh, uh, will is a valid will, and the executor has a right to transfer the property under the estate. It is more for the assistance of the executor and some controversial estates than most of us, so that in small, uncomplicated estates, we don't have to probate because probate costs money. In Nova Scotia, for the first, uh, I think it's first four thousand or ten thousand dollars, it costs eighty-five. First ten thousand costs eighty-five dollars. Um, the first one hundred thousand, it costs one thousand dollars, and there, there, thereafter that it costs one point six nine five percent, and that works out to about sixteen dollars per thousand dollars. It isn't taxes. But it isn't free either. So you want to, there are ways of avoiding probate, and you certainly can uh, if well advised. Um, if it's an uncomplicated estate, you may not have probate. But to the extent that the estate is complicated, has real estate, deals with financial institution, deals with shares, you're probably going to end up probating your estate. And that's a cost. You'll also end up paying your executor. Most wills don't say anything about the pay of the executor, and families are often shocked to understand that one of the siblings who gets to be the executor is paid for his or her work. Now, the executor can uh, refuse to take the payment, or the will can provide that there shall be no payment, but normally nothing's said, so the executor will receive up to 5% uh, the gross value of the estate, depending on the difficulty of the estate. And this money must be reported as taxable income by the executor. In many, many cases, if you're going to inherit, uh, if you're the only uh, beneficiary, for example, it may makes no sense to take executor fees. But where there's several children, it may, in fact, uh, compensate, compensate you for your time and efforts and give you a little more money. Well, assuming you have a will, how do you revoke a will? Marriage revokes it. And well, divorce doesn't revoke a will. Um, it revokes any gifts you made under the will, and it revokes a designation of your ex-spouse as a uh, executor under the will. Separation doesn't revoke a will. You can also revoke a will by specifically revoking a will in a new will. So you say, this is a will of me, Faye Woodman, and you say, I hereby revoke all previous, uh, all wills and previous testamentary dispositions. Finally, you can revoke a will by physically destroying a will. But you must have the intention to physically destroy the will. And this came up in a funny way in an Australian case where the lady carried a will around in a a um, uh, uh, wallet tied around her, her waist, and she got caught in a fire. And when she was dead, the question was, was the will revoked because it was around her waist? And the court said, no, though the will was destroyed, it wasn't revoked because she had no intention of revoking that will. The fire was an accident. This often comes up in the situation where a a uh, testator previously had a will, and then somehow at the time of his or her death, it disappears. The presumption is that if a will is no longer found on death, that the testator has destroyed the will. But that presumption can be rebutted. And if it is, you have a lost will. And a lost will can be provated. It can be used as long as there is either a copy of the will or a credible person who has knowledge of the intimate details of the will. 
I just want to briefly talk about some of the other documents that go with a will. Uh, the first one is personal care representative, or personal care directives. Under your personal care directive, you sign and it's witnessed. You usually do this in a separate document from your will, and it does two things. One, it allows you to, to appoint a delegate who will make your personal and medical decisions after you're no longer capable. And that's a good thing to do. Secondly, it allows you to direct your delegate to do certain things. And in that respect, it's very much like what we know as a living will. I don't want to be fed if I have these injuries. I don't want to be given oxygen if I have these industries. If I can't recognize anybody, I don't want to whatever. Now, I've never been in particular favor of a, a, a living will. I think partly because of shock I received as a young person. I was young in those days. And I asked my wills class, uh, what, do they, uh, what would they give as instructions in a living will? And uh, their view seemed to be that once you were over 30, you sort of had it. So, you know, bye. <laughs> <laughs> that shocked me so much. <laughs> I decided to appoint a, per, uh, a delegate, but I wasn't going to put any directions in and uh, that the uh, delegate had to follow. If the delegate has no directions, a delegate has to act in your best interest, whatever that may be. Uh, even if you put detailed instructions in the will, if technology or circumstances radically change, the court will not enforce that part of the living will. And then again, the uh, a delegate will have to revert to your best interest. The other thing that I want to talk about is a continuing power of attorney. Many of us in our business life probably have dealt with powers of attorney. These are when we're sort of completely competent, we're working in an ordinary day, and we want somebody to represent us or do something on our behalf. We may give them a power of attorney um, so that they can do certain things for you, with, which ordinarily would require your personal consent or presence. There's something now called a continuing power of attorney, which gives you rights with respect to another person's property um, in, in situations where that other person has lost mental capacity. Um, in that situation, you're able to take over whatever the personal attorney says you can take over of their financial affairs. It's a financial affairs thing, a power of attorney. Now, when I was working with a uh, elderly clinic in Ontario a couple of years ago, in my exit interview, the director of the clinic asked me, what, what did I think of powers of attorney because it gives the right to somebody else and that person is called the attorney isn't or she isn't necessarily a lawyer to to uh, essentially do or deal with your financial affairs as as if they were the the person who gave the power of attorney and I said well I thought the power of attorney was just simply a bomb I think you should think that way too because a power of attorney in Nova Scotia now gives away the keys to the safe. There's no central registry. There's very loose supervision of these powers of attorney. No reporting climate, uh, requirement unless you're forced to by other relatives. So it's a very, very loose arrangement where people do, can and do, take advantage of the senior. So my view has always been that if you don't have someone absolutely trustworthy, absolutely someone that you can, uh, will ensure will carry out your best interests and not use, as in one case, 
money to buy a car, your money to buy his car, um, then you shouldn't have a power of attorney. But of course, the alternative to a power of attorney for financial affairs, a continuing power of attorney, is guardianship. And guardianship has its own humiliating and expensive aspects for the senior. I was involved in a case where the wife, the daughter, she was a wife and a couple, uh, took advantage and remortgaged her mother's house so she could put an addition on her own. And I found it very, very difficult even to sit in the same room with her. But it was really quite interesting because the mother, the person who was wronged, really wanted to have some contact with her grandchildren. And she, I think she wanted the mortgage on her house to be taken off, maybe. But she wanted to do it with as less distress as possible so she continu could continue to have a relationship with, your, with their grandchildren. So I think many, many um, powers of attorney used incorrectly are not reported for this reason. The problem is it's sometimes very difficult to get into people's minds that a power of attorney only makes you act as a fiduciary for somebody else. It doesn't give you the money. But many people think, well, mom's going to die soon and I'm going to inherit anyway, so I'll just take this money and go to Florida or buy an airplane or whatever they want to do. Well, that's not your money. It's not the attorney's money. It's still mom's money and it should be used solely for what she needs and her interests. Another thing that comes up is guardianship. What happens to the kids? Well, uh, that's a power of attorney. The guardianship is a situation where it's normally dealt with in the will because you say, I hereby give 100000 to my daughter, Emma, age three, to be held in trust by so-and-so and so-and-so. So their financial affairs are usually taken care of by trustees in a trust. But there's another kind of guardianship, and it's a guardianship or the custody of the person. And that kind of guardianship is often very controversial, particularly where you have a single mom. Uh, I recommend that they write the guardianship uh, paper separate from the will, at least as far as personal co uh, custody is concerned. Many single parents do not want to see the guardianship of the children go after their death to their ex. And my answer to that is, in the absence of strongly disqualifying behavior, the courts will be reluctant for it to go elsewhere. So uh, I, I can't provide much uh, solace for some single parents who don't want the ex to get uh, care and custody of a child. One other comment I should say, and it's about the body. I really thought I might talk about this because the uh, situation was raised a bit because I listened to CBC a lot. And uh, they're talking about modern ways of burials. And one person on the CBC opined that she would like to be buried, wrapped in a sheet, and put in the trees, and use the bird's user. Well, my initial reaction was, well, the weather just wouldn't do for that here, <laughs> maybe in Nepal. But anyway, what I want to say to you is the person who decides on how you get buried in your burial service is your, is your uh, executor. Not you, although usually the executor takes some, some uh, uh, account of what you want. It is the guardian. It is not the wife. It is not the parents. It is not the children. So if you have any unusual ways of uh, wanting to be buried, I suggest you fight it out with your parent, or with your family before you die, uh, instead of springing it on. This happened a lot. It was quite unfortunate with some of the soldiers who returned from Kandahar. And one particularly notable thing, the husband, husband's wife 
and her par uh, and his parents fought over where the soldiers should be buried. Mm -hmm. I guess it wasn't an executor in that case. I don't know exactly the details, but that was most unfortunate. And finally, I want to say that this, I think, has been a most auspicious day to give this lecture. We all know why. I say that I'm recently retired, and I've been elevated by the university to the status of professor emeritus. But for people in the know about the substances, substances now being distributed by the Liquor Commission, it seems that in the future, I'll be able to elevate myself. <laughs> Thank you, and we'll stop for a minute, and I'll do a round of questions. <laughs>